Oscar Yankee, stroke 4x60 TQRZ. Hi guys and welcome back to another Tech Minds video. So it's been a while since I've checked out a handheld radio, so I thought this would be a good start. Now this is the iRadio UV98 Plus, now also may be known as the Radtel 880. At the time of making this video, this radio costs less than $100, and for those monies you get a whole bunch of features. Now this isn't the latest version of this radio, and I think iRadio are slightly behind Radtel as Redtail has released the A80G, which includes a GPS module and working APRS. But if you're not worried about GPS, then carry on watching, as this handheld radio not only supports 2 meters and 70 centimeter transmit and receive, it also has a built-in HF multi-mode receiver. Now it can even transmit on 27, 28 and 29 megahertz using FM, which of course covers from the 11 to the 10 meter bands. The question is though, how much power does this radio emit on those bands and are those transmissions clean? Now we'll find out later in the video. Now for those interested in listening to the airband, well, airband reception using AM is also supported, but will it be trash or will it sound good enough to hear what those pilots are saying? Again, we will test that later in the video. Our two antennas were supplied in my package the first being a longer and presumably higher gain antenna for 2 and 70. Now what was a nice surprise was the inclusion of a programming cable. Now this is actually terminated with a USB-C plug for the radio side, so that's nice to see. Now I also received a shorty antenna, which I believe is the standard antenna that you get with this radio, and this is stated to support 2 meters and the 70 centimeter band. The battery is stated to have a 2400 milliamp hour capacity and while the battery feels pretty light and it's not particularly thick, it does not appear to be a USB-C socket on it for charging like we've seen on other batteries in the past. However, there is a desktop charger and that is powered via USB and there's actually a wall mains power supply supplied in the box and depending on which country you're in, I guess will depend on the version that you receive. Now I also received two donut style antennas for shortwave and HF reception and with the right receiver and band conditions these can actually work okay. Not as good as a wire up in the air but they will receive something. And lastly well we have the radio itself. Now to be fair it's a quite nice looking radio and it has a massive colour screen. Now down the right side there's a flap which requires a screwdriver to gain access to it. But once that screw is removed, I was surprised to see a Motorola style connection. I'm not entirely sure on the correct term for this type of accessory connection. If you know, let us know down in the comments. It's always puzzled me what the name of it was. Now underneath this, under another little rubber flap, there is a USB-C socket. Now this can be used for charging the battery or programming the radio with the included programming cable. On the left side, we have the usual PTT button at the top. And then the two lower buttons are function buttons, which can be reprogrammed either on the radio itself or within the programming software. On the top, there's an SMA socket for the 2 and 70 centimeter antenna, and then there's a programmable orange button. Now, there also appears to be two rotary controls, but actually, there's only one. The center one is actually just a plastic cap that you can pull off, and this protects another SMA connection. Now this is where you would attach your shortwave or HF reception antennas to. So yep, it has a separate connection for receiving sub 30 megahertz or mode two. Okay, so let's attach the battery, connect an antenna, and then turn the radio on to see what the screen looks like. So here we have a lovely black background on the screen, making those three VFOs clearly visible. Now each of those three VFOs work independently and as far as I can tell, you can only listen to one of them at the same time. Now this radio does have a cross-band repeater function though, which is a nice touch, but I wonder who actually uses it. Let us know down in the comments if any of you guys actually use cross-band repeating on a handheld. Now the menu system is also laid out quite nicely, easy to read and navigate. I don't think I've actually seen a menu system like this specifically and it's nice to see that it's different from all the generic ones we've seen before. Now there's a lot there to go through, and on this version, at the time of making this video, there's some options which do not work. 
they are apparently left in for either future upgrades or the next version of this radio. Now, what I mean by this are the GPS and APRS settings. Now, there also appears to be some functionality relating to DMR radios, but this is purely an analog radio if you're wondering. Now, this radio does have key beeps and voice prompts enabled at default. And to me, those things are annoying. So they're the first things that I disable within the menu. Now, the menu system does have so much within it, and it would take an extremely long time to go through every single one of them. So I'll leave that for another video if you're interested or if you've got a question about a specific menu or feature and just ask it down in the comments below. Now, when you first turn on the radio, you would have noticed that the three VFOs will only support VHF and UHF. So to enable full band, turn the radio off, hold down the down arrow button, and then turn the radio back on. You will then see full band tuning show up on the screen. So now you can dial in pretty much any frequency from 18 megahertz right up to 999 megahertz. To activate the built-in shortwave and HF multi-mode receiver, simply tap the lower function button on the left side. You can also reassign this to any other button you like to make it more convenient to start. Now it can take a few seconds to load, but once loaded, you can now start receiving at sub 30 megahertz, all mode, and that means AM, upper sideband, and lower sideband. If you take a look, you can see a left pointing white arrow next to the frequency. Now this is like a cursor. So in this position, if you were to press the up and down arrow buttons, the frequency would change in the steps that are set below. You can see here that we are set to one kilohertz steps. The bandwidth is set to three kilohertz. The gain is set to automatic and we have a slight offset using that BFO control. Now think of the BFO value as a fine tune as the lowest assignable step is actually one kilohertz. But using the BFO, we can tune in stations perfectly. Shalom, shalom, voila, thank you. QRZ. now if you're wondering what antenna I'm using for this demonstration, then it's an NFED half-wave antenna up at around 12 meters off the ground outside. Now the star button on the lower left of the keypad will change the cursor position. To change the mode of modulation, like changing from LSB to USB, for example, just tap the hash button on the lower right of the keypad. Now, a few miles away from me, there is a simplex repeater, dubbed the Parrot, which records up to 60 seconds of audio and then plays it back. This is located on 70.4375 and uses a 77 Hz CTCSS tone. Now, this repeater is called MB7FM. And as this radio can transmit on 4 meters, let's perform a quick test. This is M0 DQW Mike 0 Delta Quebec Whiskey, just testing access into MB7 FM. Over. Now you might not have been able to tell from the previous clips in this video, but the audio quality and loudness that comes from the internal speaker is probably one of the best that I've heard on a handheld radio. Now take a listen to this, although this is actually tuned to my all-star node, which is actually quite close by. Thanks for joining us, Johnny. Have yourself a fine day. Uh, this is W2BLT. Let's go to KE8SMN. Jeff in Rochester Hills, Michigan. Good morning, Jeff, and what's your favorite juice? Good morning, Mr. Scott. And that's nice of you filling in for uh, Dick there. I think his tea time was like 7.15. And so I'm sure he appreciates it. Now for those interested in listening to Airband, take a listen to this to make up your own mind whether AM Airband reception is any good on this radio. Quebec. 
Well, actually, I think that sounded OK to me. OK, so let's test some output power. The power meter's output is connected to a 100 watt 50 ohm dummy load. So up on 145 megahertz, we see an output power of around seven and a half watts. And then if we jump up to the 70 centimeter band at around 435 megahertz, we actually see a similar output of around seven and a half watts. For those of you that like the dark side, dubbed dark side by Fred in the shed, output is around six watts. But remember, it would be illegal to use this radio on the PMR band here in the UK. Now the 1.25 meter band, however, appears not to transmit anything, or if it does, then it's extremely low. Strangely enough though, 27 megahertz using FM appears to output around four watts. And then if we jump up to the 10 meter band at around 29 megahertz, we see an output of around three watts. Now 50 megahertz, which is the six meter band, we see an output of around six watts. And then up on the four meter band at 70 megahertz, we see a whopping 11 watts. Although this may not actually be 100% accurate as this power meter is not supposed to work at 70 megahertz. I think it actually tops out at 60 megahertz on those lower frequency ports. Now one of the cool and interesting features of this radio is a band scope. You can choose the step size, the squelch level and the mode of modulation. You can also choose the bandwidth of the scan. Now what is really interesting is that while in this mode, you can actually change the modulation to SSB and the radio will actually stop when it detects an SSB signal. Now for those of you that are eagle eyed and made it to this part of the video, you may have seen in the first menu run through at the start of the video that the firmware installed was 1.06. However, most of this video was actually using firmware version 1.10. The firmware is available free of charge from the iRadio website, along with the firmware upload tool. You can also download the latest CPS or programming tool from this website as well. Now the programming software literally covers everything, even some features that this radio does not currently support, such as GPS and APRS. Now, like I said earlier, there will most likely be a radio that supports these coming from iRadio soon. But if you cannot wait, then take a look at the Radtel A80G, which unfortunately I do not have at the moment. Lastly then, let's see how clean this radio transmits at all the frequencies that it can transmit on. Using my non-lab calibrated spectrum analyzer, we can see a good result when it comes to the two meter band at around 145 megahertz. However, up on the 70 centimeter band at around 435 megahertz, that second harmonic is not as low as it should be. Seeing a minus 50 dBm value would be better than that current minus 30. Now as expected, transmitting around 27 MHz sees some rather tasty looking harmonics. And up on 50 MHz, i.e. 6 meters, the analyzer actually thinks the third harmonic is the fundamental, i.e. the main transmit signal. The third harmonic is actually higher than the desired frequency. Up on 70 MHz, the 4 meter band, which the US will not really be bothered about, also appears to be quite bad. Now none of this is kind of unexpected. The filtering for these out of band transmissions will literally be non-existent. However, one thing I forgot to mention earlier was that when changing between certain bands, you can actually hear relays clicking inside the radio. I think this is the first time I've actually heard relays clicking on a handheld radio. Now just to show you what an external low pass filter does to a dirty transmission, take a look at this. Now this is just using a homemade low pass filter and while this is not perfect, it's definitely a lot better than without one. Anyway guys, there we go. That's the iRadio UV98 Plus. Now I think for around $80, it's a fun radio to play with. It has lots of potential and features just as it is. It's also nice to see that the firmware is actively being developed. I think I clocked at least two releases in just as many days. Now let me know what you think in the comments. And while some of you will just call it junk, you are all entitled to your own opinion. Of course you are. However, I think it's a cool little radio. And if you imagine having something like this 20 years ago, you would have literally wet your pants. Anyway guys, thank you to my subscribers and YouTube members. 
and all of you guys that watch my videos is very much appreciated. Until the next one, take care of yourselves and I'll see you in the next video.